Okay, uh, welcome WAP students. Um, let's talk about your unit one exam here. Uh, this is your study guide for your exam, so I hope that you take good notes from this. Um, these topics come specifically from your exam. So we're going to start off Christianity in Africa. So remember that Africa, <coughs> excuse me, in its earliest days was uh, animistic and ritual religions, uh, local religions, but that the Muslims originate, uh, originating here across the Trans-Saharan trade network brought Islam into Africa. However, there were strongholds that uh, resisted the incursion of Islam, and that was over here in Ethiopia and also up here in Egypt. These are two areas that remained uh, at least dominantly Christian during the time period 1200 to 1450. Now, staying with Africa, there was a group of people called the Bantu peoples. And the Bantu peoples are sub-Saharan, meaning below this big area here. This is the Sahara Desert. They migrated throughout all of the rest of Africa. And as they migrated, they spread their agricultural techniques. The areas they were moving into were uh, hunters and gatherers foragers and things like that, well, they brought the ability to farm and it changed Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. They also brought their iron working abilities. The fact that they knew how to um, smelt iron was a, was a really big deal. And they spread that knowledge throughout Africa. They also brought their language. There are many, many different dialects in Africa, a thousand different dialects, but many of those dialects trace their ancestry back to the Bantu language, sort of a mother tongue, if you will. All right, shifting gears just a little bit, going north into mid medieval Europe. Let's talk just a little bit about what happened in Europe following the infamous Black Death. The Black Death happened in the middle of the 1300s, and it was about a four-year period with immense amounts of deaths. Upwards of 100 million people died in Europe during the Black Death. But understand uh, the effects of the Black Death, that peasants gained some power for the first time in a very, very long time because there were less of them to work. Nobles make money because people work their lands. The land makes them their money. But with less peasants, the peasants had a supply and demand issue. And so they were able to hold out for wages. And this essentially broke up the feudalism system. Uh, it made the feudal system break down because for the first time, peasants actually had some leverage and power. Um, they also, during this time period, the peasants would turn to religion to help uh, defend their attitudes and their views on the feudal system and what is acceptable for them as a people. Now, speaking of religion, let's go over here to South Asia, India, and Southeast Asia. Uh, these were areas that saw the influx of other religions, such as Islam. <clears throat> Islam came in, of course, from the Middle East. You had the Delhi Sultanate here in the northwest part of India. And Islam would also come into many areas in Southeast Asia. Uh, remember that it made good sense to convert to Islam because of your trade issues, that they gave you special rates if you were a fellow Muslim. You had areas here in Cambodia, uh, like uh, Angkor Wat which saw influences from Hinduism, which originated, of course, in India. Uh, there were also elements of Buddhism as well, which also originated in India. You had Song China. We started off the year with Song China and realized that Song China was much smaller. It contracted in size from Tang China that preceded it, uh, but that it is a commercial center thanks to the influx of Champa rice from Vietnam. This was a fast ripening rice that allowed far more harvest every year and more food equals more people. And uh, you were going to see China under the song be become really the, the biggest power in the world for those years. Um, they're an economical center with the, the highest manufacturing capacity. Uh, they also, they're going to outsource their culture to areas around them, such as Japan. Japan looks to the song and, and models themselves. Korea looks to the Song Dynasty and models themselves, Vietnam, all of those places look to China as a cultural influence. And that's the kind of power that Song China wields here in this time period. Now, Song China is 
very centralized. Of course, everything runs through an emperor, but not all areas in this time period were centralized. In Asia, in, in India, South Asia, um, it was decentralized. You had, even with the Delhi Sultanate, the you had the Rashput kings who were ruling locally. Uh, certainly decentralized was Europe, where you had all these different kingdoms, where you had lords doing their own thing on manor systems. It's very decentralized. Uh, Japan was decentralized as well. Uh, and, uh, Japan and Europe have very similar societal breakups. We'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, another centralized one was the Abbasids, the uh, very powerful uh, Muslim dynasty. And remember that all of Islam, wherever Islam touches, is called Dar al-Islam. And it's supposed to be a unifier. All right? the, the Muslims want all of their people to be unified. So they'll do things like, you know, you have to do it. You're supposed to do a pilgrimage to Mecca. That's a unifier. You know, you follow the Quran. That's a unifier. Language, unifier. Uh, where we go? All right, Confucianism. You have to understand Confucianism. Confucianism is not a religion. It is a belief system that originated in China. It predates the Song Dynasty by quite a bit, uh, but the Song Dynasty is going to move back to Confucianism, and they're going to start using it uh, quite a bit. Confucianism was based off of the five basic relationships. Very important to understand that there was a certain relationship between a ruler and their subjects. There was a relationship between a husband and a wife, between a father and son. So you had these relationships, and if you followed them, it would restore social order there in China. Uh, it was based heavily upon filial piety, a term you have to get comfortable with, being good to one's parents. Uh, the, the elders were highly respected in Chinese society. Um, and again, Confucianism is it, going to help restore that social order that was lost once upon a time there in China. Going back, we got to bounce around a little bit here, going back to Europe. Uh, feudalism versus manoralism, there's some slight differences. Uh, manoralism is the economic system. You have a manor you have that the noble, the Lord lives in, and then you have his church that's in on his property, his workshop that's on his property, uh, his peasants and his fields which are on his property. It's an economic system. Feudalism deals with the relationship between nobles and their vassals. Um, this, you owe me something. You owe me military service if you're a knight, and I will provide you with the finances to, you know, buy your weapons and stuff. There's a relationship there. So manoralism sort of exists within feudalism. Um, manoralism is more the relationship between the lords and their serfs. And remember, there's a slight difference between serfs and peasants. Peasants are farmers that work the land, but technically they can get up and move and go work for some other lord. Serfs cannot do that. They are legally bound to the land. An important distinction. This time period highlights long-distance trade. There are two major long-distance trades we talked about. The first long-distance trade we didn't hit very much because it comes in the period before this is the Silk Roads. The Silk Roads originates from China, goes through India, makes it all the way to Europe. It's a network of roads on land. It's also part of this Indian Ocean trade as well. Those are all part of the Silk Roads. But in this time period, we see the emergence of the Trans-Saharan Network, that Muslim network taking camel caravans across the Sahara Desert and establishing major trading centers here in Western Africa. You also see out here long-distance trade in uh, the Indian Ocean, where India becomes sort of a central figure in that, and China is getting uh, fabulously rich, and so are the Southeast Asian islands as well, the Spice Islands getting quite a bit of wealth from that. Um, going back to Dar al-Islam, you need to understand that Islam blended with local customs. You know, Islam is going to make its way into Africa. It's going to make its way into Europe yeah, and India. And it never looks the same in any of these places uh, as it does in the Middle East, the origin, the origin of Islam. So it's going to be a little bit different. It's going to take on local marriage practices and customs and things like that. Uh, the Muslims were really important because they uh, kept a lot of ancient knowledge, such as the Greek and Roman knowledge. They trans, uh, transcribed a lot of scrolls in their house of wisdom. Uh, so the Muslims took information that came before them uh, and they improved upon it. So very, very important. In this time period, the Muslims are going to be some of the best. They're going to have some of the best naval instruments. They're really going to help the age of exploration, um, which is coming up for Europe and China. 
All right, let's talk just a little bit about the religions and, and do a little compare and contrast here. Uh, let's start with the three monotheistic religions, meaning they believe in one deity, one God. That's Judaism, the oldest of these. Uh, Christianity, which came next. And then the most recent was Islam. Um, all three of these have a lot of similarities. They all have a holy book, the Torah, the Holy Bible, and the Quran. They also have belief in one God, Yahweh for the Jews, uh, uh, God for Christians, and Allah for the Muslims. They also all believed in a judgment day that would one day uh, come into being. On the other side, the other two major religions that you have to know is Hinduism and Buddhism. Hinduism, both of these originate out of India. Hinduism is the world's oldest organized religion. And it has thousands of deities, gods and goddesses, but it's based off of a caste system that keeps people in their place, doesn't allow for much social mobility. Now, Buddhism, founded by Siddhartha Gautama, comes well after Hinduism, and it's very similar, has the same gods and goddesses. But one of the things, one of the major differences is that Hinduism rejects the caste system in Hinduism. If you are born a woman or of low caste, it's because you did something bad in your previous life and you will have to suffer through this life. And if you do what you're supposed to do in your caste, then you will be born into a higher caste in your next life. It's the cycle of reincarnation. Buddhists reject the caste system. And so it's much more popular with women and poor people because, you know, it doesn't put the blame squarely on them. Um. Christianity and Buddhism, out of all five of these religions, uh, Christians and Buddhists are the ones who create monasteries and monks. The others don't do that. Remember, the Sufis represent the, uh, the Muslims, but they are not building monasteries. And the Jews don't have these monks. Uh, neither do the Hindus. Okay. What was life like for women in this time period? Herstory versus history, basically. Um, very non-public, of course. You're going to have very, 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 very few female rulers in this time period. Um, most women tended to be either midwives or healers if they had a job. Um, but aristocratic women in areas such as Europe and sometimes in Japan, uh, they managed households when their husbands were gone at war, whether it be crusades or local wars. Um, so women did have some authority and power in that regard. We also want to compare Japan and Europe, their social hierarchies. They're, they're eerily similar, considering that the two had no contact with each other until a little bit later. Um, in Japan, the top of the pyramid belonged to the shogun, who was a military dictator. Underneath the shogun technically was the emperor, but he's a figurehead, so we can almost skip him. Uh, but under the shogun was the daimyo. They were the nobles. Uh, under the daimyo were the samurai, and the samurai were like knights. They were the warriors. Under them came peasants, and then weirdly, because Japan's a little different and they're influenced by Confucianism, merchants are the bottom of the social heap. They have more money than peasants, but peasants have more status in society. Now, in Europe, the top is the king. The next level is the nobles. So the nobles and the daimyo are similar. Knights are the third level, and they are like the samurai. Uh, they have a job of protecting peasants and serfs. And then you have peasants, and then below peasants is serfs, which is essentially slaves, but I guess on the technicality, it's not actually a slave. All right, our last order of business here, our last topic that we're going to cover is Mesoamerica. We've got three really important uh, societies there. We have the Mayans, we have the Aztecs, and we have the Inca. So we're going to do some comparisons here with a little bit of contrast uh you need to know that the maya were the longest lasting of these three um easily a thousand years that they were based in city states 10 to forty thousand strong in these city states that rubber they had a rubber ball game uh, there were rubber trees there that they used um they had cocoa uh, chocolate was a big deal for them uh, maize is a big deal for uh, both the Mayans and the Aztecs, it's like the main deal, corn. Uh, it's it's uh, it's the staple crop for those societies. Mayans gave us a fancy calendar. They gave us the concept of zero. Uh, they also had human sacrifice. And, uh, you know, they're going to actually fall on their own probably because 
their population could not support food. There was a drought, and and we think that they just abandoned their cities. Uh, the Spanish did not conquer the Mayans. Important to note. The Aztecs, however, were these group of nomadic uh, people called the Mexica, who migrated into this into Central Mexico, modern day Central Mexico, and settled on Lake Texacoco, where they built their capital, their great city of several hundred thousand strong, Tenochtitlan. Uh, to do this, they used floating gardens uh, to help feed their populace, and uh, they were known as incredibly talented warriors, uh, but they could not defend themselves against the disease and the guns of Cortez. Um, last one that you need to know is the Inca. The Inca are geographically situated in South America. Uh, they're going to start in modern day Peru and they're going to go down along the coast of West Africa. Uh, they're known for their tremendous roads, something like 25,000 miles of roads. And, and they, you know, as big as their empire was, they were able to communicate and move troops very quickly along these roads. They're known as master engineers, even though they didn't have uh, any kind of concrete. Their stones were perfectly cut so that they fit into place. Uh, they also had a concept of Mita, which is sort of a socialism. Uh, everybody would owe manual labor to the betterment of the state, you know, once a week or whatnot, whatever it was. Unlike the other two who both had written languages, the Inca had no written language. Uh, they recorded economical transactions on a roped, a knotted rope string called a quipu. And the Inca would fall to the Spanish conquistador Francisco Pizarro. Um, so there are so, certainly some similarities between those three uh, American groups, uh, but you need to know their differences as well. All right. If you stop this video and write down the information and take good notes over it and listen to it a couple of times, you're going to be far more successful on your AP exam than otherwise. So I wish you good luck and, uh, you know, put in the time, put in the effort and there'll be a good payoff for you.